Hi everyone, and welcome to 3GNY Stories Live, We Do Wednesday. I'd like to wish you a happy new year and hope those of you who fasted had a meaningful fast. I'm Gail Peck, 3GNY board member and director of the We Do Wednesday series. I'm a grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. I'm thrilled to be here for our seventh We Do Wednesday featuring guest speaker, Ariel Delman, who has a fascinating story to share. 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and our supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to support a, provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. Founded in 2005 with a group of six, 3GNY's membership now exceeds 3,000. Over these past 15 years, we've held diverse in-person programs of all sizes around the New York area. 3GNY has also played a leading role in launching other 3G groups, including 3G DC and 3G New Jersey, and we're in conversations with others all around the country to hopefully help in launching more. We're now in full swing with our virtual events and are proud to share our work with a wider audience, along with our valued community members. I started We Do Wednesdays because when the pandemic hit, I was looking for a way to keep sharing stories, even if we couldn't host live events. And I want others to see what many students get to see, our talented and passionate speakers talking about their families and teaching lessons from the past that are relevant today. In July, we held our first We Do Wednesday and have had them every two weeks ever since. For me, it's been rewarding getting to know each of our speakers and working with them and the rest of the 3GNY board to bring these stories to all of you. All of these programs are recorded and hosted on our YouTube channel. So we're building an archive of our stories, which keeps them alive and increases their exposure. We Do Wednesday showcase 3GNY's flagship initi initiative, We Do, which is short for We Educate. This initiative empowers grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their families' Holocaust experiences in school classrooms and with community groups. It's now my pleasure to welcome Farah Krauss, 3GNY board member and director of We Do, who will share more about this impactful program. Farah has been instrumental in the success of these We Do Wednesdays, and I'm proud to do this important work alongside her. Thanks so much, Gail. Hi, everyone, and Happy New Year. I'm so glad to be here tonight. We've all seen the heartbreaking studies stating the lack of Holocaust knowledge amongst recent high school and college graduates. The good news is that students who do receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to challenge incorrect or biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. This is why we do is so critical today. It's a four-week training program to teach grandchildren of survivors to learn and compellingly share their family testimony in school classrooms. 3GNY has trained over 250 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and most recently around the country on Zoom since the pandemic hit. Through our grandparents' testimony, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often where small injustices are found, on the playground, in the classroom, on the street because it's the easiest and most efficient way to act. By the time Nazi tanks roll in, it's too late. We've reached over 25,000 young minds and we know we need to do more. Our speakers have received over a, thousand, over a thousand thank you notes from students. I've been speaking in school classrooms for 10 years. The most heartwarming notes from students explain that they plan to share my Bubby Eva story with others. They will strive to stand up against hate and bigotry. And most important, importantly, that they plan to learn more about the Holocaust. Hope is not lost, and we need to keep doing the work. You can help us accomplish this through a financial gift of any amount. This will go directly towards training more speakers, thus reaching even more students. We do not solicit donations from schools, teachers, or students. We provide our programming to schools completely free, and we aim to keep the cost of training to 3Gs as low as possible. There's a link with ways to donate in the chat, and we hope you'll consider making a gift. Thank you for helping us honor the memory of our grandparents and ensuring that never again is more than just an empty phrase. I'd now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Arielle Delman. Her story is fascinating, one we know you're all excited to hear. Arielle is the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. Her grandmother, Helen, frequently talked about her experiences during the Holocaust, which had a profound impact on her life. Arielle has been inspired by her grandmother's strength, 
perseverance and dedication to her later life's work of speaking about her experiences for those who could, for those who could no longer speak. Ariel is a licensed clinical social worker who has worked in nonprofit organizations to serve youth, families, and older adults in a variety of settings. She attributes her desire to serve others as a direct result of her grandmother. She continues to honor her grandmother's life by speaking about the Holocaust to students across New York City through our Redo program. And now I'm pleased to introduce Ariel. Thank you. Um, before I start, I just want to thank 3G and we do for the opportunity um, to talk to so many of you. And I'm so thankful that you are all here to watch and to listen. It's very hard for me to talk about all of this, um, but it's so important. Um, and that's why I'm here to tell you about my grandmother. My grandmother was Helena Sternick Jonas and she was born in April of 1925 outside of a town near Krakow, Poland. She was the youngest of three girls. Um, this is a picture of her and her sisters, Betty and Sidel, um, and her mother, Lola. My grandmother's the one sitting on the, on the, standing on the bench, and I think she's about um, 10 years old in the photo. My grandmother said that when she was a child, she didn't really notice anti-Semitism until after they actually moved into the city of Krakow when she was a few years older from when that photo was taken. She remembered that her parents were really scared about her older sister going to school because they had started to hear that people were attacking Jewish people out on the open street. When my grandmother was about 14 years old, um, and you can see in this picture, she had just finished public school and she was planning to go to vocational school, but she wasn't given the chance. Um, because uh, the same year, um, in 1939, Krakow became the center of a Nazi occupation in Poland. And there were a lot of restrictions mandated. Um, synagogues, which are places where Jewish people pray and worship, were forced to be closed. All Jewish people were forced to wear uh, yellow stars to identify that they were Jewish. Uh, people were not allowed to own businesses. They couldn't walk on sidewalks. And as I said earlier, um, they weren't allowed to go to school. Everyone was forced to work regardless of their age. My grandmother said that she was forced to clean rooms of occupying Nazis and had to clean the streets. A few years later in 1941, her father and my great grandfather, Simon, um, as you can see in the picture here, knew that families were being separated and sent away. And um, he sent a letter in January of 1941 to ask that his daughters stay with him and my great grandmother. And this is the actual letter um, which was saved and sent to my grandmother decades later. In the letter, he talks about all of the work that he did as an iron worker and a locksmith for the country and he pleads for his family not to be separated. At this time, um, also, a ghetto had been created in Krakow where Jewish people were being forced to live. This is the ghetto in Krakow. Um, the ghettos in this context were small living spaces for thousands of people um, where they were, they were separated from the rest of the town. They were encircled in high walls, um, often with high walls or barbed wire, and they were guarded on all sides. Um, if you wanted to exit, you had to have approval. This area once housed about 3,000 people and would eventually hold 20,000 people. In March of that same year, 1941, my grandmother and her family were told that they had to leave their home and enter into the ghetto to live there. They were told that they could only bring, um, only pack what they could bring, what they could carry, and, and nothing more. My grandmother said that she remembered they had no idea what to bring. They had no idea what was happening. They had no idea how long they would be there, um, but they were going to stay together. And so they were hopeful that things would get better. Um, one day when the family was all together in their room in the ghetto, two Nazi officers burst into the room and they began to drag my grandfather, great grandfather away. My grandmother had no idea what was going on. She and her sisters were so scared about what was happening. Um, and all the while, as he was being dragged away, he was soothing his children. He said, don't worry, 
don't worry. They're taking me to work. They, they must need me. But that was not the truth. My grandmother saw him that he was taken with others um, to the town square where they were left for days without food, without water. No one was allowed to go see them. No one was allowed to help them. And these people were forced onto cattle cars. Um, these were literally used to transport cattle. So they had no windows, they had no bathrooms, they had no seats, and they were taken by train. She later found out that her father was taken to a concentration camp called Belzic and murdered in a gas chamber. A year later, when my grandmother was 17, she and her family, her sisters and her mother, were taken to a concentration camp in Plaszow, Poland. This is the camp. She was forced to clean some soldiers' barracks. And on one sunny day when she was doing that, she happened to be cleaning the windows when a man in a uniform stopped to look. She remembered very clearly his voice said, if a Jewish girl is smart enough to clean a window on a sunny day, she'll probably be good enough for me. My grandmother had no idea who the man was or what, was, what had just happened until the next day when someone came to take her to the man's home. This man was Amun Get. He was the commander of the entire camp and he had just had a villa built for him and his mistress. This is the villa, which was just outside of the camp. And now my grandmother was being forced to serve him in his home. When she got there, Amon Get asked, what is your name? And she said, I am Helena. And he said, I already have a Helena. I don't need another Helena. Your name is now Susanna. She told me that the first thing that she had to do was to iron one of his shirts. And while she was ironing, Amon Get came up to her and he smacked her on her face. And he said, a girl in Austria your age knows how to iron a shirt, but you can't because you're just a stupid Jew. And she started to cry and he yelled at her and he told her that there would be no tears in his home. And she realized in that moment that she had to grow up. She was separated from her mother and her sisters, even though they were in the camp. She was alone with this man who she would often in conversations about this would describe him as a monster, a man that she and others hid in fear of and experienced living terror each moment in his presence. This was a man who took pleasure in killing people and was personally responsible for murdering over a thousand people. She and the other woman named Helena were forced to live in the villa and sleep in a room under Amunget's room alone. They took turns so neither one stayed with the other. She had to become so attuned to his patterns of behavior and any sort of cue that might tell her how he might be feeling, what he might do, so she could try to survive his cruelty. I remember that she would talk about that she would so often just stare out of the kitchen window and she would see the people marching and she would be so envious of these people because they were not alone. They were with others, maybe their family, but she was alone. While her, mother's and her, while her mother and her sister were, were in the camp. And she would actually sometimes uh, try to sneak out of the villa or where she was staying to try to visit her sisters or her mother to give them food. But this was always with the risk that she and her family um, and anyone else that might have tried to help or have seen could be killed if Amun Get found out. Before she had been forced to work in the villa, um, when she was still living um, in the barracks, she actually had a boyfriend and his name was um, Adam, Adam Stab. 
And Adam actually was a part of the, of a secret resistance group at the camp. One day, um, Almond Get must have learned that Adam was involved in the group and there was something going on. And, and he came up to my grandmother and, his, uh, and he said, Susanna, where is Adam? And she said, I, I don't know. She saw Adam and Gut get on his horse, ride away. And soon after, she heard gunshots. And she knew that Adam had been murdered. And Adam's death was even more painful for her because more recently, her mother had died from pneumonia in the camp. And Adam had buried her on his own in secret. So only he knew where her mother was buried. When people died at these camps, they would either burn their bodies or dig huge holes for mass graves. So without knowing where her mother was buried, she realized that she could never go to pay her respects to honor her mother, which is what happened to the millions of people who were murdered during the Holocaust. And during all this time since the villa was created, Amon Get would have parties with Nazi officers. Um, and one of these officers was named Oskar Schindler. And this man and many others, he, he began to become over and spend more and more time at the villa. And Schindler, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, was a Nazi officer who ended up saving the lives of over a thousand Jewish people. But my grandmother didn't know who this man was or who he would be. To her, he was just another Nazi who looked like he was very good friends with Amon Get. But um, there were a few times when she, he briefly he would speak to her um, alone and try to comfort her. One of these times in particular, he came to her and pointed out at the window and he said, do you see the people marching? Um, do you remember the people in Egypt? They were freed and you'll be freed too. And she didn't understand why he was saying this. Um, she just knew that she could not trust this person at all. Later on, towards the end of World War II, um, my grandmother was in the villa one day working and she heard a knock at the door. There were two Nazi officers um, and they asked for Almond Get to come with him, come with them. Almond Get um, grabbed his coat, put it on, grabbed his belt, put it on, and grabbed his hat. And he marched with the officers out of the house. Well, what happened was he had been arrested. Um, the reason why he had been arrested is all throughout this time, you know, when um, people were coming into the camps, all their belongings, all their valuables were being taken and um, being held um, and used um, by the Nazi party. Um, but Amon Get had been keeping a lot of this for himself, and they were not happy with that. This was his own undoing. Now, my grandmother, again, had no idea what had happened. She didn't know if Get would be coming back. Um, but a few days later, she heard another knock at the door. And this time, it was Oscar Schindler. And he said, you're coming with me to my factory. He had built a fake factory um, as a cover to take people from the camps um, to free them. And he did it by claiming that he needed workers. And he asked her if she had any family. And she said, yes, I have my two sisters, Betty and Sidel. Um, and they were put on a list, which is you know, famously known as Schindler's List. Um, you can see um, underlined in the red is my grandmother's name, Helena Sternlich. And above and below her are her two sisters. Um, and on the actual poster, for Schindler's List, um, you can see under, I underlined um, my grandmother's name and her sister's names are actually there. Um, so he, Schindler kept his promise when he said, you'll be freed, you'll be safe. 
you know, my grandmother and her sisters were so full of joy. They were so happy. They were going to be freed. Um, but they had to first leave the camp. And so in order to transport the people out, um, the men and women um, were going to, to go to Schindler's factory, were separated, and they traveled in, in cattle cars. Now, um, as something happened when the women were being transported, um, something happened with um, Schindler where he was briefly arrested. And as a result, the women um, were actually, including my grandmother and um, my great aunts, who were actually, instead of being brought to the factory, um, ended up being taken to Aus Auschwitz. Um, this was a concentration camp designed for mass murdering Jews and other people where over 1 million people um, were murdered, including by gas chambers. This was literally the end of the line on the train tracks. When they came to the camp, they were forced to walk into a large room, leave all of their belongings, and take off all of their clothes. They were told that they were going to showers. This was exactly the same thing that the victims of gas chambers were told before they were murdered. At this point, my grandmother still had the photo of her parents. This was the one precious thing that she had to remember them by. And she knew that she had to keep the photos with her. But how? Well, my grandmother noticed that each woman was being given a block of soap. So very quickly, she started to scratch out a hollow part with her finger. Um, to try to hide the photos inside. But all of a sudden, um, she saw a woman towards the front of the line get smacked in the face by an officer, and the woman's bar of soap was knocked out of her hand. So very quickly, she decided that she would tear the photos up as small as she could and hide them under her tongue. The photos that I have um, were very damaged, um, obviously, because of what happened where they were placed. Um, they were recreated by an artist after the war. After about three weeks of being in Auschwitz, she and her sisters were called outside and taken on a train again, this time to Oskar Schindler's factory. Now, once they were finally liberated and World War II was over in 1945, my grandmother and my great aunts were um, in a displaced persons camp in Austria. Um, this is where people would go. If, you know, they would try to find each other's family, um, connect with people, recover, you know, many people were malnourished and very, very ill and sick. Um, and during this time, my grandmother had met a man named Victor and was dating him. And it just so happened that um, Victor actually found out um, look, that his fiance was still alive and um, they came to the camp. So they got back together. But Victor um, happened to introduce his best friend, um, Joseph Jonas. Um, and a while, a little while later, um, they got married in Salzburg, Austria. And they were eventually able to come to the United States. They um, first actually lived in one room um, of an apartment with a lot of other families in the Bronx. Um, they started to work, they saved money, and they were able to have their own home and start a family together. They had a son and two daughters, my uncle, my aunt, and my mom. This is their house um, with their dog Snoopy. Um, they each started their own businesses. My grandfather um, owned a convenience store and my grandma had um, a beauty business out of, she ran out of her home, their home. And um, you know, while they moved forward from their lives, what they went through was not forgotten. My grandfather, like many others, um, experienced severe depression and survivor's guilt after losing most of his family. Um, and eventually, he committed suicide when my mother was about 24 years old. This was even harder for my grandmother and now her children because there wasn't a lot of understanding about trauma, about depression, about suicide, like there even is today. So she faced a lot of confusion and anger and exclusion from those around her because other survivors didn't understand why someone 
who survived the Holocaust and escaped death as millions of others had not, how a person like this would want to take their own life. After losing my grandfather, my mother, you know, continued to move forward in her life. She found meaning and purpose. Um, she showed a lot of strength and a lot of love. And she began to share her story and the story of her family and the story of her people. And these are some photos of, um, oh, sorry, I just realized. These are some photos of um, her speaking. Um, and she spoke in order to educate others so that no one would ever forget the lives lost uh, in the Holocaust. And she reminded people that we all have power to make a choice, to do good, to help others, or to ignore, to destroy, to hate. And she was really the first person to teach me about resiliency and the strength that we all have and how we all carry the pain of what we've witnessed and heard of trauma. And she would always talk about how she felt that she needed to speak for those who couldn't and how she wouldn't let the fact that she simply, that she survived simply be the end. Um, she actually later, later in life traveled back to Poland decades after the Holocaust um, for the very first time since, back to the very place that she was beaten and forced to work. Um, the place that she lived in fear of um, every moment of her life so that a documentary called Inheritance could be made to inform others about her experience and about the children of perpetrators of the Holocaust. And like I said, this was the first time she'd actually gone back to Poland since being liberated. Despite everything that she went through, all of the trauma she experienced, she went back because she knew how important it was to further document this, to have more opportunities to educate people and, and make sure people knew what, what had happened. My grandmother was a very important person in my life. She still is, um, but she passed away um, in 2018. Um, Actually, a, a couple months before she passed away, I actually registered to take the, the WeDo training to be able to come and speak to you all and to speak to students. Um, and I'm really happy that I was able to tell her that I was doing that. Um, and so now I carry the responsibility of sharing her story and speaking for those who can no longer speak. Um, so. And the impact of the Holocaust did not end when the people were liberated and World War II was over. Um, it continues to impact my family and it continues to impact me to this, to myself to this day. Um, and that's, that's why I'm here. So thank you. Ariel, thank you so much for gifting us with your family story. Uh, we're now going to open it up for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A and we'll do our best to get to it. Um, right before we start, I just want to read um, something from Barbara Beyer. Um, she said that your grandmother would be so proud of you and she always spoke of how, you, how much she loved you. And Barbara's one of her best friends in Boca West and says she misses your grandmother dearly. Thank you, Barbara. So the first question, um, they wanted to know if your grandmother ever talked about her experience while she was at Schindler's factory. You know, I don't really remember as much. Um, she was really, she spoke about Schindler and, and things he said to her, but she was, it was more a focus on um, really the, the horrible experiences she had that was mostly like what I, I remember. Was your choice to be a social worker inspired by your grandmother? Can you speak Def to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I just, I, I think from seeing my grandmother and, and my mother as well, um, and I think my mother was also very um, influenced by, by her, her mother. Um, 
and her father too, um, of like seeing how the importance of helping other people is just something um, instilled in me. And um, yeah, I, I would just, that, that, that's really what it was. It, I, I just found that because I was working in other roles too, that it wasn't as fulfilling. There was something missing. And once I kind of, I went back to grad school and I, I went into social work, I, the pieces kind of fit together for me. What was it like watching Schindler's List? I've actually never seen Schindler's List. Um, I don't see the point in watching it. I'm also on it, to be honest with you, very scared of watching it. Um, but part of me is just like, I know what happened. I was fortunate, um, I guess, that inheritance was made because I got to actually see the place, the places that she talked about. And she talked about in the, and she talked to, talked to me about in real life that she was pushed downstairs um, where she, she was smacked, where she would watch um, from the kitchen and watch the people marching. Um, I got to see all those places and, and know what it was really like, um, even though it wasn't physically there. And that um, alone was very powerful um, and a little traumatizing. Um, so I kind of feel like there's no point. And there's also some things because of the way um, they wrote the film, there were two, like I said, there were two um, Helenas. Um, they kind of combined both of their experiences together. And um, my understanding is um, there's a scene where um, the character, the Helen is sexually assaulted. And that didn't happen to my mother, that happened, or grandmother, that happened to the other woman. So I just didn't want to see that. How did your parents respond to everything that happened to your grandmother? Um, I think, I mean, my mother, my mother grew up with both of her parents. At first, I think, think maybe not as much talking about it. It would come from time to time. And then um, she kind of, she, I think she learned a lot more um, when her grandmother started to talk a lot more um, after my grandfather passed away um it a lot of it was kind of like they wanted to just they wanted to put it behind them they wanted to you know be be here in america and they didn't want to think about what happened and it was kind of like it was i mean it was really hard i mean i i don't really know what it would be like as a parent to explain that to your children but um I mean, my mother's tough as nails, and, and but she's also like the, has the biggest heart in the world. Um, hi, mom. And um, yeah, I think it. I think it had a real impact on her, but um, I think it just made her all the the stronger. And it's just, yeah. Have you traveled to Eastern Europe to see any of the sites in person? No, and um, I don't. I don't think I ever plan to, at least right now. Um, the experience of seeing all these photos and um, knowing a lot more about my grandmother's experience because of the documentary, because a lot of research and um, has been put together because of it, um, be, you know, because of my grandmother's like story and experience is a little bit more well known. I've I've seen a lot more, and and that alone was like is a lot to to process to handle um and I just I don't think I could like handle it I think this is enough for me but um there I've also just to briefly say um I this the stuff that I know about my um grandparents I know my, my grandmother um, didn't go back to Poland um, until the documentary was made. My grandfather actually tried to go back to Poland after the war because um, he'd actually, his family had uh, a house there and like a store. Um, and when he tried to go back, um, people had taken his home and were like, if you ever come back here, we're going to kill you. And I think that whole experience um, just made me feel very frightened, and disconnected from what happened. So I just had no desire to really go back or be there right now. 
How did the students that you speak to react to this story? Um, I, I think it's a lot. I mean, it's a, it's a lot to tell. It's a lot to hear. By saying a lot, it like, doesn't even scratch the surface of it. This is very heavy, traumatic stuff. Um, I think it's for um, the students that I've spoken to, I, I see there's an impact. Um, I've had some really amazing questions asked and just had students come up to me and, and thank me and I'm just like, you're welcome, I'm just talking. I mean, not that I'm just talking, but um, I see it has an impact on them and, and I'm, I'm very grateful that it's, they're, they're um, finding, that it's impacting them and that they're, they're communicating that because um, it's, it's important to continue educating um, more and more generations of people. And here's a question from another Redu speaker. What is the most important thing you learned from your grandmother and her experiences during the Shoah? I think it was that it's important to continue to speak out even like even I mean she, like I, I have my own like experience which um, I, I mean I've had to like before even just doing this again today I had to practice like four or five times um, when I did the we do training, I had to practice over and over again, even thinking about it, like at different times, I have like a, like a physical response. I'm trembling, my heart rate's going fast. I, I, I'm like in that fight flight sort of um, feeling in, in my mind. Um, and it's very scary. So I, I can only imagine what she felt like every single time she had to relive this over and over again, telling it, but she did it anyway because she knew how important it was. She even, like I said, she even went to Poland. She, she was like, part of her, she didn't want to do it. She didn't want to go back. It was, it was probably like a, her worst nightmare. She, she continued to have nightmares about being chased and, and haunt, like um, attacked by Amunget and everything that she saw, like until she, until basically she, she passed away. So for her to continue speaking about it, spoke to her resiliency and strength and sense of purpose. I tell you, she, she literally believed that she was, she thought that she was saved so that she could speak for others who couldn't. And so she, especially after my grandfather passed away, she realized how important it was to speak out and speak out about anything. So that, that's really, I think, would be the most important thing is to speak out when you see things that are going on that are wrong, that are hurtful to people, and stand up, even if it's scary or overwhelming. Um, how old was your grandmother when she passed away? And um, part of the other part of the question is, did she have numbers tattooed on her arm? Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't remember her exact age. I know she was in her early to mid 90s. Um, she passed away in 2018. Um, so I can't do math right now. Um, she doesn't she did not have um, she didn't have numbers tattooed on her arm, even though she was in Auschwitz. Um, I, I don't know why they didn't tattoo her, but she, she didn't have numbers. Uh do you know your grandfather's story of survival? And I guess in addition to that, um, what was it like learning about your grandfather's story versus your grandmother's story where there was a lot more public information available? Yeah. Um, so I know a lot less because of my grandfather's story, obviously because my grandfather passed away and I never met him. Um, and we know what my grandmother shared with us and um, I know, um, you know, a little bit from uh, reading um, some things that were like my, some people wrote a little bit about my grandfather when they spoke about my grandmother. Um, but it's significantly less and it was very frustrating. But I, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I guess uh, that I there's so much. I mean, I have, I have books on my shelf. Um, with like her quotes and this documentary. And I had, I had a lot of resources. Um, 
that I could that I could use besides my own my own memories, um, which was really helpful. Um, and also just the experience of actually hearing my grandmother's stories and like seeing um, the actual villa, um, which someone still lives in, um, and to kind of fit it together to have a better understanding of her experience. But for my grandfather, I, I know a lot less and it's frustrating, but um, I know that he lost most of his family except for one brother that actually, I think um, Schindler actually, um, he, he had like the list of, he had his list and he realized later on, um, I think he met my grandfather's younger brother and he was like, oh, there's another Yona, jo Jonas. Are you related to Joseph? And he was like, yeah. And then um, my, my, because my grandfather actually thought all of his family had, had died, um, had been killed. Um, so they, they were able to find each other through Schindler. But um, I know a lot less because the family kind of, after um, my grandfather committed suicide, they just parted ways. Um, yeah, and I, I would love to know more. There's a lot of, there's like a book that I actually have, I think about the town where he grew up in, um, that's in Polish and I would love to try to get it like translated so I could read a little bit more about it. Cause I think he's mentioned is the family's mentioned in the book. So, um, Leora Hellman says that your grandma was 93 when she passed. Thank you. Um, she said her husband and and she were blessed to know her um, and how wonderful a person she is and she's living on. Um, and another comment from your cousin Lola, um, she's very proud of you. Um, you and um, a question about um, when your grandmother went back, um, did she meet any descendants of the Villa family? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, so the documentary, um, if, well, we go back to it, um, yeah. Um, so the woman on the in the in the movie poster on the left is or, or on the right no the poster on the left um, is Monica I forget what her last name is and she is the daughter of um, Amunget and his mistress um, and so my grandmother at the time when this documentary was made was the only person alive who had known both of her parents um, so. She, my grandmother met um, Monica, and then I briefly met Monica um, actually when my grandmother was on a TV show, and um, but I, I didn't really speak to her. And I've um, seen I, I've never spoken to um, Monica had a has a daughter who wrote a book, um, and uh, I've seen her, but I've never. Um, spoken to her and it's um very eerie the the resemblance that the both of them have to um Amaget. you see it a lot of um their his face and their faces and i'm sorry so this, i didn't know if there was another question this question is about your grandmother's sisters um I guess, where did they end up and what kind of relationship did they have with your grandmother after the war? Yeah, um, so my grandmother's sisters, they, they all, they both came, Betty and Sadell um, came to the United States um, and they, you know, they were all together. There's, I, I don't have, I wish I had some other, I think I had other photos I was going to include, but I, I didn't, um, of her and her sisters. Um, and, you know, they would all be together for the holidays and um, eventually my, my grandmother also moved to Florida and Betty moved to Florida. Um, I didn't really n know my um, great aunt Sadell. She um, passed away, um, I think in the 2000s, I can't remember. Um, and she had Alzheimer's. Um, but I know that they were, they were close, but you know, the, the, they, they each kind of went their own separate ways. Um, but they, they were still connected.
Did I, did I answer? Yeah. Is there another question? Uh, no, I think we're gonna wrap up the Q&A. Thank you um, so much for speaking tonight and gifting us with your grandmother's story. Um, thanks again for all you viewers who um, are on tonight, wherever you might be located for joining us. Uh, we're so glad you took the time to hear Ariel speak words that must never be forgotten. If you haven't yet made a gift to support our educational programs, we hope you'll consider making one now. Please refer to the chat for ways to donate. Thank you. Also, if you have connections with educators who may want our speakers to present to their classes, please be in touch with us. And we hope to see you again soon. We have some great virtual events coming up, including We Do Wednesdays continuing every two weeks. On Wednesday, October 14th, Emily Greenspan will share her family's story. And on Wednesday, October 28th, Elizabeth Caymans will speak. On Thursday, October 8th, 3GNY is partnering with the Blue Card to host a virtual wine tasting for Simchat Torah. And on Thursday, October 15th, 3GNY and 3GDC are hosting a Confronting and Undoing Racism with Care from a Jewish Perspective, featuring Yehuda Webster, a community organizer for Jews for racial and economic justice. We'll be sending out an email tomorrow with details and registration links for these events, as well as a recording of tonight's program. You can also check out our past Way to Wednesday speakers on our YouTube channel. We encourage you to share our work with friends and family so we can ensure these stories are reaching as many people as possible. Thanks so much for taking out the time for your evening to be with us. Have a great night.